Now we're reading, please, in John 4. Verse 1. <clears throat> the RAV says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, Sir, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you do not know what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is the Spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went away into the city, and said to the man, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. <laughs> no wonder. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Philippians 2, please. Philippians 2. Philippians 2 and verse number 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. 
Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And 2 Corinthians, please, very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5.18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. My folks, all around us there are people who live in a totally different thought world to the world that we live in, if we are believers. I was quoting this the other night, you know, when some of us go down there to downtown radio and we, we, we try to communicate in two and a half minutes gospel truth for broadcasts that go out just before the midnight news and so on. You have to get it very concisely. I always remember what John Rosborough said, uh, the head of programming at Downtown Radio, and he's still there. He said to me, one day, he said, we cannot get preachers to understand when they come on this station that they are not talking to their own people. We just can't get them to understand that. That they are not talking to their own constituency. We try to tell them that there are a quarter of a million people out there who aren't used to the kind of language they use. He says we can't get them to understand that it is very important to communicate with those people who don't understand the language that they use. And I suppose the reaction of many preachers would be, well, they need the truth. And if they don't understand our language, well, that's because they're ungodly and they're lost and they need to understand our language. And so very often preachers, when they are communicating, they use phrases that unconverted people haven't a clue what they mean. And we could list a whole lot of them, but that's not my purpose tonight. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic, I'm trying to be realistic. And very often we who preach, while we are preaching, many in our congregation cannot understand even some of the very phrases we use. They don't have Bible knowledge, no background of Bible knowledge. And it's not easy. But then it's even more difficult in this generation for preachers, especially many of them who are trained in theological seminaries. Because very often they are now being trained to preach by men who are not believers. I had one on the phone to me the other night, a lay preacher who was having to listen to a lot of stuff, and uh, the first thing he sort of heard was, well now, when it comes to the ascension of Christ into heaven, we'll not stay too long with the liftoff theory. In other words, the man who was teaching him to preach about the ascension wasn't too sure whether Jesus actually left the earth and went back to heaven. Well, I mean, where do you go from there, folks? A fellow came to me not very long ago in Glasgow, Scotland, and he told me one of his lecturers in theology at Glasgow University, professor, if I remember right, of theology, was an atheist. In other words, fellas being trained for the Church of Scotland ministry were being taught by a man who didn't believe there was a God. Okay, fellas, now, now you go and minister to all those Church of Scotland congregations all over the world. 
because there are Church of Scotland uh, congregations in all sorts of places. Just now, you go and do that, but when you go and do it, just remember that uh, I don't believe there is a God at all. I mean, can you imagine anything worse? I talked to a minister of a leading uh, denomination here in Northern Ireland the other day, and he looked at me, he says, our theological seminary, he says, has gone to the dogs. And I never said a word to him about his theological seminary. I was about one of the first things he said to me. He says, Derek, it's going to the dogs. And he says, fellas are going in, he says, who love the Lord and know the Lord, that's what he was implying, and they were coming out really confused. And I'm afraid that that's true in many places. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic or arrogant or holier than thou, it's a fact. And many young men who rise in these days wanting to give their lives to preaching are now finding when they go to theological seminaries that those theological seminaries don't accept the Bible as the inspired word of God. So they are teaching them to stand up and preach with a rag bag in their hands. You can take this bit, but you can't take that bit. So that even theological students are now faced with unconverted people teaching them theology. That's a problem. And some of you are aware of that. Then, of course, there is that uh, biochemist, maybe that you know well, who works near you, and uh, he thinks he's only a few steps away from creating life in a test tube. Or there is that student, maybe at university with you, who's very interested and committed to the armed struggle, as they call it, in Northern Ireland. And then there's that other fellow that you know, that sort of who cares party boy across the hall from you at college. Or that's that girl that lives down the road from you and she just has about everything a girl could want. Or there's that housewife who's trapped in suburbia and struggling to keep up with the small children around her and the Joneses and a dozen civic demands at the same time. Or there's that victim of divorce. Or that broken home who can't trust anybody. Or there's that neighbor right next door to you. Or there is that relative. Or there is your mother or your father right at home. And I could go on all night about all the different kinds of people in the strata of society who are, many of them, lost spiritually. How do you even begin to communicate the gospel with them? And of course, we're living in very fast-moving and changing times. I think it was Dr. Carl Jung who commented, the central neurosis of our time is emptiness. Like a leading pop star recently said, I believe in nothing. So that there is this universe next door. And it'll take an incarnation to reach it to enter into their world, it'll take an incarnation. You see, the incarnation of Jesus Christ is one of the most spectacular examples of cross-cultural identification that the world has ever known. And Christ is our role model for evangelism. You know, when the Apollo mission blasted off for the moon, those fellas didn't identify in any way with the moon. If they had, they'd have been dead in seconds. They took a whole lot of paraphernalia from Earth, oxygen, suits with them, equipment, clothing, food, nothing of the moon, but everything of Earth. And then they came off the moon again. They had a kind of a is there a problem here, Andrew? Is it my tie? It's certainly not my hair anyway, I'll tell you that much. Okay, we'll just get it right. Up better. Good. 
These fellows are very patient. He identified. Hello, Debbie. Where have you come from? And I know what you're thinking. It's not his hair either. There we go. By the way, this is one of the most faithful Tuesday nighters that you never see. He's never been in this pulpit in his life. And he works. And never again, hopefully, he says. And he works thoroughly. And he's been here every Tuesday for maybe 10 years or eight anyway. Thank you, David, for all your hard work, brother. We deeply appreciate it. Thank you. And when the Lord Jesus comes down to earth, he's different to us going to a place like the moon. Why? Because he doesn't bring any, any of the paraphernalia of heaven, if you like, with him reverently speaking. And he doesn't come down and sort of shout the gospel at us from the clouds and say, hey, you folks down there, you need me and I'm the answer to your problems and shout it at us. No. The wonderful mystery of the incarnation is that he brought nothing with himself but himself. And that's wonderful. For God to communicate with us through Christ, he accepted a vast cost. And what was that cost? That the eternal Son of God would not remain safe in the community of heaven, but that he would literally come down to earth. I mean, it's mind-bending when you think about it. With great humility, that beautiful Savior took upon him the form of a servant. And he didn't just touch down like a visitor from outer space, but he entered our world as a child. And he came as an incarnate being. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, that was different to the Pharisees, folks. If a prostitute came near a Pharisee, they used to swirl their cloaks around them like this and shrink away. If a leper came near a Pharisee, they used to take stones and throw them at them. The Pharisees threw them at the lepers. But the amazing thing about the incarnate Savior is that he shrank from nobody. God shrank from nobody. And we who belong to him, if we are believers tonight, are, according to Paul's teaching in Corinthians, ambassadors for him. Ambassadors. And we are called to identify with what's going on in other people's minds and other people's struggles and understand them and yet at the same time not get so closely identified with them that we forget that we represent heaven. If an ambassador were to so closely identify with the people that he is sent to that he forgets where he was sent from, he wouldn't be ambassador very long. You and your farm, university, college, school, or office, business, wherever you are, you are an ambassador for Christ. You're the only Christ they know. They never read the Bible. They never pray. They're in a totally different universe of thought from you, totally different. But you say that you belong to Christ, so they watch you to see what a Christian is like and how a Christian behaves and how a Christian reacts. 
You know, Scripture teaches us that even the jolliest extrovert that you'll ever come across, the person who shows seemingly no interest whatsoever in spiritual things has deep anxiety and pain inside. Some of the greatest, as we call them in Ulster, cods. A cod in Ulster is not a fish. It is a comedian, a fellow who's bubbling over with jokes and humor and so forth. Even people like that, deep inside, there is anxiety and pain. We can only reach them in truth when we are prepared to enter their suffering and feel their pain. We've got to put ourselves into their doubts, into their fears, into their struggles, into their loneliness, into their alienation. And the strongest warning in the Bible against those who do not do this is the story of Job. The story of Job and his comforters. You remember that? Now these fellas left their homes and traveled a long way to come across Job and they began an incarnation, that is to get right into where he was. They began an incarnation. And when they arrived, they could hardly recognize Job because he had been disfigured through his illnesses and trials and with a symbolic Jewish uh, action, they tore their garments apart and they sprinkled dust on their heads and they sat down beside him for seven days and seven nights. And they never said a word. They were so moved by the grief and the situation that this man was in, they were speechless. Would to God that kept their mouths shut. If only they had kept their mouths shut. But instead of that, they trotted out their conventional orthodoxy and they said, well, you know, really, you're going through this because it's a penalty from God for your personal sin, a personal penalty for your personal sin. They were totally insensitive to the man's need. If they had kept quiet, they would have comforted him and helped him. But because when they went to try and get close and get into his doubts and fears and difficulties and trials, and believe me, there are chapter after chapter after chapter of them in the book of Job, they made an absolute mess of it. Why? Because they were insensitive. Now, surely if you and I are ambassadors for Christ and there are people who are next door to us or next to us who are in a totally different universe of thought, we're going to need some principles whereby we will help them to find Christ rather than to make a mess of it. We're going to have to find some principles somewhere where we can identify with them and get through to them. Some kind of training before we start. Is there any example that we can follow in all of the Bible that will do this and communicate with the unconverted? Yes, there is. The classic example in the Bible is the woman at the well. Now, I want you to see this woman and what the Lord would teach us from John chapter 4 about her. And you want to get close to people, you want to identify with people, you want to get into where they are and be a true ambassador for Christ. Well, watch how Christ approached this woman. By the way, Davy, when I said that to you in the pulpit there, I hope I didn't hurt you, brother, about your hair. I didn't mean to, and I'm sorry. It came off the top of my head, and I'm sorry if I've hurt you. I didn't mean to. I apologize, brother. I, apologize. I can say it about myself, but not others. I'm sorry. And I love you in Christ. 
Let's see the seven principles that are involved in this situation. And they're beautiful. Number one. How can I put it simply? What on earth would there be in common between the perfect Savior and a woman like this? I mean, you couldn't have two people... You talk about a universe next door. Well, there's a universe just sitting by this well. Now, where on earth would he begin to try and win a woman like this? Well, first of all, he contacted her socially. Socially. It would seem ridiculous that I would have to say that it's important when you go to win people that you must make social contact with them. That would seem ridiculous. You would think that that would be self-evident, but you'd be amazed that some Christians have absolutely no non-Christian friends. You could be born in a Christian home. You could go to a Christian primary school. You could go to a Christian high school in certain continents of the world. You could go to a, a Bible college after that. Then you could join a Christian firm, and then you could work for them, and then retire to a Christian retirement home and have a Christian burial. And through all of that, you need never really make any contact with a big world outside. I mean, can you imagine a fellow setting off to fish for fish? And he's got all this regalia on, Waiter boots the lot, got the fly here and there's in, in, along his cap the flies and he's got this fantastic rod and he's got this bag over his back and he, he looks the bee's knees and he's going off to fish and instead of heading out the door he climbs the steps of his house and goes in and fills the bath with water and sits in the bath and fishes all night and the wife brings him coffee and, and uh, you know this is great and he looks terrific and he's fishing. Yeah, sure, he's fishing. He's got his line in the water, but there are no fish there. And how many evangelistic meetings in Northern Ireland are like that? But we've got to have a meeting. Yeah. Well, are there any fish here? No. Well, are we all believers? Yes. There's not an unconverted person here tonight. Well, but you've got to preach the gospel, brother. Be faithful. Okay, I'll sit in the bath. And maybe you'll give me a cup of tea in your house afterwards. And I was faithful. Yes, it was faithful to preach the gospel. But I didn't catch any fish. And there are some churches I go to, and to be quite honest with you, I don't think they're particularly worried, some of them, that there are no fish there. They're quite comfortable sitting around the bath, having fellowship with each other, because there's no fish to bother them don't have to haul them out or anything like that. It's true. Evangelism. How ridiculous at times when we say we're evangelizing and there's nobody there to evangelize. You've got to make contact. And of course, with a whole lot of people, when they go fishing for the Lord, you know, they all, uh, they make contact or they try to make contact, but they all go to the one place to fish. I mean, I had a friend called Harold. Still is my friend, and he might be after this, I hope. I might lose a lot of friends tonight, but he, he, he's coming along one day, and he says to me, Derek, come fishing with me. I said, sure, Harold, yes, I'm, I'm, I haven't much patience to fish, but I'll go with you, yes, at Newcastle Pier. And uh, I, I went along, and I stood there, and there were a shoal of mackerel going by, and there were about 16 men all fishing off the end of the pier. And Harold said to me, Derek, just uh, stand with me here. And Harold shoves in, number 17 or so, gets a wee space. And I knew, I mean, I'm no fisherman, but I knew he was going to get his line caught with the other guys. But he throws it out anyway, and I thought, I'll go for a wee walk. And sure enough, within a few minutes, they got their lines tangled. A whole lot of Christians are like that. A whole lot of them in Northern Ireland are like that, and there's a big wide world, and if God has called you to fish in Northern Ireland like he's called me to, I, I've got to stay here because that's his orders. 
But if you're here and you're trying to fish and it's not under the Lord, Lord's orders and there are a whole lot of other people all around you fishing and they're all fishing in the one place, just remember there's a big ocean out there. There's a whole world to win. And you could be doing marvelous work if you, you weren't getting your lines caught with all these other Christians all standing in the one wee cozy corner. If you launch out into the deep, you'd catch a great draft of fish. But by the way, what happened to Harold? Well, I'll tell you what happened to Harold. I went for another walk and suddenly I heard this voice, come back, come back, come back. And I thought he's caught something. So I go back and he had. And it had taken his hook and his line and his sinker. Very nearly took Harold. <laughs> and what was it? I tell you what he had hooked. He had hooked a catamaran. <laughs> now a catamaran, for those of you who don't know, is a yacht. And he had hooked him nicely as it was going by and it nearly pulled him right out over. And I mean, it was so funny, Harold says, come back, come back, stop, stop, as if the catamaran had brakes. It just sailed on by, and we laughed. And I said to my friend Harold, I said, Harold, get yourself a boat, brother, and launch out into the deep. It's true. Let your nets down for a draft. Yes, we've got to make contact socially with people, but let's not all go to the one place. He needed to go through Samaria. You know, I know what I'm talking about. For many years, for many years, I preached on Newcastle Promenade, summer after summer. And you know, the church I belong to, we had an open air, open air from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And then there were other folk, they came down, and they had an open air. Uh, from, we went from 4 to 5, and they went from 3 to 4 three to four and then we came on four to five then we went seven to eight then they came eight to nine and we went ten to eleven every day apart from Mondays which was a day off can you imagine how difficult that was and sometimes I used to be involved in that and the Lord really blessed us and we had some fantastic meetings in fact I took over a thousand of them so I kind of know what I'm talking about but sometimes I used to stand there and I used to think, Lord, here we are and we're preaching away every hour. They're opening our meetings on here and that's good. But there are other places in the world that are dark. How glad we're going to New Zealand this summer and I want to go to New Zealand because 0.8 of 1% of the entire population go to church. You know, it's good to work in Ulster, but hey, it's good now and again to get in your boat and launch out into the deep where the need is. I see some of you fellows and girls with the gifts you have, teachers, doctors, solicitors, lawyers, some of you, oh, what your gifts could be, how powerfully they could be used in the dark places of the earth. I think of wee Heather Finch, we are praying for her last week, she used to come every Tuesday, and there's wee Heather, I had a letter from her the other day, and she's in Uganda dealing with these children who have AIDS. And going around from church to church and away out into the bush and getting people and sitting down under mango trees and, and reading the Bible and teaching them the word and teaching the women how to cook and so forth. And she never thought in her wildest dreams really that that's what she would, would be doing. And she's just in her 20s. But boy, is God blessing her. What an inspiration. And many examples of Ulster young people like that who are serving God abroad. Hey, come on, it's important to go fishing, but let's not all fish from the one we spot. I wonder would the Lord call some of you tonight a way to serve him in a place of need. You say, would he call me? Hey, sister, why would he not call you? You say, would he call me? Derek, do you think, brother, why would he not? You say, what could I do? There are lots of things you could do. Lots of things you could do. If you're open and available to the Lord, say, Lord, just send me wherever you want and I'll go. You'd be surprised where he might send you. It's important to make social contact. But make contact not just here, way out there across the world. But of course, there are some missionaries who, according to Michael Griffiths, they go, say they're sent abroad, and they go, and some of them never mentally unpack. Never. And they're not all like that, thank God, but there are some of them who are, and I've met them, and I've met them on the mission field. They don't study the history of the country they're in. They're not interested in the literature of the country they're in. Uh, they have no appreciation for the art and music of the country of their adoption. They are not interested. They can't be bothered. They are foreigners, and everybody knows it, and they don't last long. 
They regard their own culture, British culture, American culture, whatever, as infinitely superior to the culture of the country they are in. So their hearers reject the gospel, not because they perceive the gospel to be false, but because they perceive it to be alien. It's very important when you are called to make social contact with people for Christ that you understand the kind of people you are dealing with, that you identify with the problems of the people you are dealing with, that you understand what makes them tick, how they think, what their culture is. You must not ignore it. Apostle Paul showed us that very clearly when he preached to the great philosophers and he was able even to quote their poets to them because he had read their poets. We saw in Daniel that Daniel got a first-class honors degree at the University of Babylon in Chaldean literature. And I can tell you it wasn't Jewish literature by any means. He identified. See this woman? This woman was absolutely amazed that Christ would even want to make social contact with her. since the cultural and religious differences between them were vast. What does the Bible say? The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. A bit like Catholics and Protestants sometimes, isn't it? We not want nothing to do with them. And where do we get this phrase that you hear in Ulster time and time and time again? Well, you know, if they had you, you know. I mean, if they had you, they'd really shoot you. And you say, who told you that? Well, my granny used to tell me that. And then you ask your granny, well, her granny used to tell her that. And that really, honestly, if the truth were known, if they had a chance either side, they'd kill you. And you'd be amazed that the vast majority of people on both sides believe that. Or an awful lot of them. You're awful quiet. It's true, isn't it? Is it that in Ulster we have come to the position we are not even allowed to make social contact? If a person carries a certain tag, you're not even allowed to make social contact in case you would be contaminated. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a, a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? These two communities were poles apart. They didn't even drink water together. And I think that that's why this passage is the real role model for evangelism. Christ became a man first, and then he needed to go through Samaria and then he needed to sit by that well to win that woman. And I believe if there hadn't been another woman in the whole world, he would have become incarnate the whole way from heaven, become incarnate, and go the whole way to Samaria and sit by that well and wait for her to win her to himself. That's some cost, isn't it? You know, I think of Adoniram Judson. He went to Rangoon in, in 1813. And it was six years before that young fellow, a university graduate of his day, a brilliant young man, six years before he felt he could even preach in Burmese. Six years. And when he died, he left when he died in 1850. 7,000 believers in 63 churches. And he translated the whole Bible into Burmese by himself. But he paid the price. He was widowed twice. He lost several children. He suffered long separations from his family. And he was afflicted with much illness. In fact, he was chucked into prison in the Anglo-Burmese War in filth and heat and dirt. And they said he was a spy. And he spent 11 months in there in the death cell. And in 37 years of missionary service, he went back to the United States once. Now, I'm not saying that that needs to be done nowadays with the tremendous travel we have and the availability of being able to get to see your loved ones if you're serving abroad often. Of course not. But what I'm trying to say is, look 
at what he left behind. One young life who not only sat and thought about the need of Burma, but went and identified with them and studied their language for six years before he even felt he had it well enough. Because sometimes when people are studying language, they insult the language by going too early and preaching in it. They insult the people by not learning it well enough. What I'm trying to say is, folks, are you going to win souls for Christ? It's a costly business. Whether you do it in Bally McCarrot, Bally Will Won't, or Bally Slot McGuttery, or wherever you go, it's costly. But you've got to make social contact. You know that postman that comes to your door every morning? Do you say, oh, there he's late again. That, that post office, they're ridiculous. They never, you see, first class mail, it's ridiculous. Do you ever remember that that guy has maybe been through a long morning? Do you ever give him a cup of tea? You say, hang, hang on, Derek. That's going too far. I mean, nine, 20p for a stamp? A cup of coffee? Well, in the snow at the moment, if you handed him a cup of coffee some morning, you might have to pick him out of the snow. That wee canteen lady who serves you every day, you know, do you ever look across and say, I was really good today, dear. That was lovely. You'd be, you'd probably have to pick her off the floor. That bus man, that... That friend that you meet, that, that guy who's brushing the street as you walk by every morning, do you ever stop and say, you know, you do a great job there, I don't know how you do it. Social contact. I know one man who shall remain anonymous, and he used to walk the length of the Lisburn Road every morning for about 14 years. And you know, he could hardly get to work, because everywhere he went, people were saying, how you doing? Hello, what about you? Because he talked to everybody. Whenever he had to move jobs, it near broke his heart because he had a real mission field, going to work every morning. People knew him. I'm amazed at people who, who don't see other people. They're just going after something, but they don't see people. Make social contact. Now, how did he do it? What did he use as a bridge of communication to get across great gospel truth? Well, of course, there are many Christians who think when you're going to communicate the gospel that you mustn't wait around with non-essentials. You've got to get right to the point. Hey, mister, you need to be saved. Your soul's going to hell if you're not saved. You need the Lord, sir. Just like that. And then they run for it. They think that preludes to witnessing is a waste of time. But Jesus didn't start with, excuse me, lady, do you know who I am? No. In this incident, he began by referring to something in which she was obviously interested. Now, what could an immoral woman in Christ be interested in? Well, she had come to draw water. So Jesus started right there. That's what they had in common, water. And then gradually, he directed the conversation away from this known interest to a spiritual reality, which he knew nothing about. Tell me, answer me honestly this question. Do you resent somebody coming to you and holding a one-way conversation and expounding what they think about that and the other without even asking you if you're interested? You say, I do not. I'd show them the door. Well, does it make you start wondering if the speaker cares about you at all or if he just wants to hear his favorite little speech again? So much of evangelism sometimes is a one-way conversation. I find a very, very useful thing is, is this wee card here. See that wee card? It says thank you on the outside. And when it says thank you on the outside, on the back it's got these words. It says, thank you for your help and efficient service. It was much appreciated. Did you know, did you know that in serving others, you follow the best possible example? And the Bible says that Jesus took the nature of a servant when he came to earth, and he told his friends he hadn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus left the glory of heaven to serve humanity. He loved you so much, he gave his life to put you right with God. Today, he wants to come into your life and give it direction and purpose. He wants you to make you the person 
You were always meant to me to be. Would you like to know more? I'd be glad to help you. And I put at the bottom my name, Crescent Church, University Road, Belfast 9, printed. And I get on planes. And you know when you're sitting on a jet and there's about 300 people going out and a stewardess says, goodbye, sir, goodbye. Goodbye, madam. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, madam. And she's nearly dry. Poor girl's exhausted. And she says, as she says goodbye to you, thank you, sir. You just hand her a wee thank you card. Hey, she nearly falls 35,000 feet if it were possible. My, they grab them. And look at them. What's this? Just a little thank you card. You say, Derek, that's a gimmick, is it? Morgan and I went to buy a kitchen clock one day. Kitchen clock? In British home stores. <laughs> Get a lot of money for saying that. I do not. <laughs> I do not. I do not. But I went to British home stores. And I said to the girl, have you got a clock? Oh, yes, sir, we have a clock. And she brought out a kitchen clock, and I bought the clock off her, and I gave her that wee card because she's served me well. Now, six months later, I was standing on the door of the Crescent. This girl comes in. She says, hello, you don't know me. I know you. She said, you bought a kitchen clock off me. I said, did I? Yes, she said. And when I read that little card, it made me think about God, and I began to think about my soul, and I went along to church, and I heard the gospel preached, and I got saved, and I've been sitting listening to you for weeks. And every time I sit eating my cornflakes and look up at the clock, I think about her. Just a wee card like that. I was in the House of Fraser one day in Glasgow. It's a lovely store, and I'm standing at this elevator. And uh, this lady standing, and it was a long time of coming, and I asked her where a certain floor was, and she said, well, sir, it's up here and there and whatever. And we got in together, and there's a wee lady sitting, running the elevator, you know, pressing the buttons and all the rest of it. And uh, I thought, I'll give her a wee card. So I give the wee lady sitting on the seat, running the elevator, one of these cards. When I got out, see the lady that I had asked the question to standing down below before I'd got into the elevator? She near took my head off. She says, wait, I mean, sir. I said, what do you mean? She says, you give that woman one of those, and you wouldn't give me one. And I thought, dear me. So I whipped out one, and I said, there you are, madam. You see, they're very powerful. Imagine people saying, you wouldn't give me one. She doesn't know it's a gospel tract. <laughs> ah, there's a way of fishing, you know. There's a way of fishing. It's called bait. It's called bait. Succulent bait in nice colors with the greatest message on the earth in it. That's only an idea, but it, I find it very useful. I know a fellow, he's now with the Lord, he was holding gospel meetings in a certain village and he went long and this man's lying under a car, he's a mechanic in a garage and he hated the gospel and he hated Christians and he hated anything to do with it and if the man had asked him to a meeting or something he'd have cursed him, he said so afterwards, but my friend came along and he looked down at this guy under the car and he got down his hunger and said, excuse me sir, do you like polo mints? And he loved polo mints. He said, certainly, sir, thank you very much. And he took the mint, and the man says, would you like to come to some gospel meetings? Well, how do you refuse a guy who's given you a polo mint to go to gospel <laughs> meetings? And he went to gospel meetings and became a Presbyterian minister. You say, let's give out more polo mints. Well, who can tell what the Lord will do? He got saved and became a, a, a minister. See, it's important to find a point of common interest I write a newspaper column, excuse the eye, but every week I have to write it. And every week in life I've got to look out over the news that's coming in, especially on a Thursday morning where I've got to get, meet a deadline for a Friday. I say, Lord, what can I pick out of world news this week that'll get the gospel across? And you know, I think over the last few years, it was in Canada once, standing looking at the Niagara Falls, and a fella told me a story about a wee boy who went over the falls. You know what happened? A wee lad went over the falls, and his life was saved, and he went to a Christian camp a few months later, and his father said nobody was to know that he was the lad who went over the falls. Because the press hounded the lad. He's one of the most famous little boys in all of North America, one of the only children who's ever gone over the falls or people, and survived. Don't let anybody know he went over the falls and I'll let him go to the Christian camp. And they had a campfire meeting and the kids were giving their testimonies and this wee lad stands up. He says, you know, he says, I've been saved twice. <laughs> hey, what about that? He says, once when I went over the Niagara Falls and the kids near fell into the fire. He said, what, you went over the Niagara? Yes, I did, he said. And then I met the Lord and then I got saved. Well, I mean, there's a story. And I faxed that home to Ulster in about seven seconds on the machine. 
You think of Seamus Heaney becoming Professor of Poetry at Oxford, the only Irishman who's ever uh, done that. Well, you say, what's that got to do with the gospel? Well, a whole lot. Poetry is very important, isn't it? So I tell them the story after talking about Seamus Heaney for a while. Tell them the story of uh, how Charlotte Elliot wrote a poem called Just As I Am Without One Plea and gave it to the most famous poet in England, William Wordsworth, and uh, his daughter Dora got converted. And you go to Grasmere Churchyard and you stand there and there's a cross etched on that grave and wrapped around the cross is a lamb and underneath it him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And what does that say? That says Dora got saved through a poem sent to her by Charlotte Elliot called O Lamb of God I Come. Well, if that's not a newspaper story, what is? Uh, you take, uh, you take uh, for example, uh, that famous painting of Van Gogh's that went for, what, 30 million, 40 million? Well, there's a beautiful story in there because Van Gogh used to be a gospel preacher, an evangelist, and there lies a the story. Or, um, well, I could go on all night. Uh, you take the tragedies that we, we have in our land, the troubles we have in our land, and everybody in Ulster is saying to us, where is God in Ulster? Well, I get into the Second World War and into the camps of, of Germany and what they did to the Jews and some of the stories that came out of that. I mean, you could go on forever. All I'm trying to say is that's the kind of thing God has called me to. And how can I put it in another way? Well, you look at the back of that, and I mean, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. But you know, out of the mess of that, what does it spell? Jesus is victory. You wouldn't think it on that side. But out of all of the messes of life and all of the problems and trials in Eastern Europe, look at it. It's absolutely bombing with gospel stories that you could use sitting in a cafe, talking to your friends. Pick it up and start using it. Say, have you noticed what's going on at the moment? What do you think's going on? And before very long, you'll be telling them about the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You know why the most of us don't witness? Well, we probably feel probably ignorant about it. We just don't know what, how to witness. And secondly, we're, we're dead scared of witnessing. We're scared of it because we're afraid they'll ask us hard questions and where Cain got his wife. They say, I, don't, I wouldn't know how to answer that. Or, or maybe you've had a bad experience of somebody in an earlier life, uh, not an earlier life, <laughs> an earlier time coming to you and giving you a rough ride, really tearing into you and tearing you apart. And you were annoyed and embarrassed and hurt. And you say, I wouldn't want to hurt anybody. Oh, the devil uses those things to stop you making social contact and then, of course, establishing a point of common interest. You can almost begin with anything, anything in a conversation as the Lord leads you, and it can move to a spiritual theme. It's everywhere around you. Even Shakespeare said, you know, there are sermons in, in the very stones. And there are. Then notice how the Lord aroused her interest. Oh, it's beautiful the way he uses his words and actions to arouse a positive response. Could you do the same? Could you arise a positive response? He begins, talks about water. If you knew, you know, this and that, and I could give you living water, and she starts getting interested in it, and he leads her by arousing her interest. Slowly. I love this one. Hey, how about this, folks? How about this? Fellow on a plane. Not all of you mightn't like this, but I think some of you will. This fella sat down on a plane, and he's sitting on a plane, and the fella beside him says, I'm in the figure salon business. We can change a woman's self-concept by changing her body. It's a really profound, powerful thing. I'm sure it is. His pride, he says, spoke between the lines. You look my age, I said. Have you been in this long? Oh, he said, I graduated from this University of Business Administration, and they've given me a lot of responsibility, and I'm honored, and I hope to eventually manage the western part of this operation. So you're in a national organization, I asked, becoming impressed despite myself. Oh, yes, we're the fastest growing company of our kind in the nation. It's really good to be part of an organization like that, don't you think? And I nodded and I thought, he's proud of his work and his accomplishments. Why can't Christians be proud like that? 
We're so often apologetic about our faith and about our church. So looking askance at my clothing, he asked the inevitable question. He said to me, and what do you do? Oh. Well, it's interesting, I said. We have a similar business interests. You're in the body changing business, and I'm in the personality changing business. By the way, this guy was a preacher. We apply basic theocratic principles to accomplish indigenous personality modification. <laughs> he was absolutely hooked. But I knew he'd never admit it. Pride is very powerful. You know, I've heard about that, he replied. Do you have an office here in this city? Oh, we have a whole lot of offices. We have offices up and down the state. In fact, we're national. We have at least one office in every state of the union, including Alaska and Hawaii. Well, he had this puzzled look on his face, and he was searching his mind to identify this huge company he must have read or heard about, perhaps in the Wall Street Journal. As a matter of fact, I said, we've gone international, and the management has a plan to put at least one office in every country of the world by the end of this business era. I paused. Do you have that in your business, I asked. Well, not yet, he said. <laughs> but you mentioned management. How do they make it work? Oh, it's a family concern, I said. It must take a lot of capital. Oh, you mean money? I said, yes, I suppose so. No one knows just how much it takes, but we never worry about that because there's never a shortage. In fact, the one who owns it, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. Oh, so he's into ranching too, the fella said. <laughs> No, no, I, it's just a saying we use to indicate his wonderful wealth. And my friend sat back in his seat, musing over our conversation, and what about you? Well, the employees, you see, there's something else to see, I said. They have a spirit that pervades. It works like this. The father and son love each other so much that their love filters down through the organization so that we all find ourselves loving one another too. And I know it sounds old-fashioned in a world like ours, but I know people in the organization who are willing to die for me. Do you have that in your business, sir? I was almost shouting now, and people on the plane were beginning to shift noticeably in their seats. Not yet, he says, not yet. And quickly changing strategies, he asked, and do you have good benefits? Oh, I said, they're right of this world. <laughs> no, actually, he said, they're substantial. <laughs> they're substantial. I have complete life insurance, all the basics. You might not believe this, but it's true. I have holdings in a mansion that's being built for me now for my retirement. Uh, do you have that in your business? Oh, not yet, he said, not yet. <laughs> And the light was beginning to dawn. You know, one thing bothers me about all you're saying. I've read the journals, and if your business is all you said is, why haven't I heard of it before? Well, that's a good question, I said. After all, we're a 2,000-year-old tradition. Wait a minute, he said. You're right, I interrupted. I'm talking about the church. I knew it, he said. You know, I'm Jewish. Do you want to sign up, I asked. <laughs> now, that mightn't be your approach, but, but I thought it was pretty good, wasn't it? This big guy who thought he had everything. So as the Spirit gives you opportunity, arouse interest. You know, you can arouse interest in folk as the Lord leads you by saying all sorts of things. Then, fourthly, don't go too far. You'll notice from verse 13 to verse 19, this woman was interested, wasn't she? And she was very, very curious. But notice Jesus didn't give her the story at once. And you'll find her interest rising right through those verses. And she was ready for more, but gradually he revealed more about himself. And then when her curiosity reached fever pitch, you know, in verse 26, he then tells her who he is. Now, you know one of the greatest problems in witnessing? Sometimes when Christians notice even a faint glimmer of interest in a non-Christian, they rush right in and rattle off the whole gospel without coming up for air and without even waiting for audience response. You know, if a bird's sitting on a perch and you were to approach him like that, he would fly away. And of course, you see, notice my wee poem at the bottom here of this. It's not mine. came from Borum, but it's good. When you go fishing on the bottom of your notes. Keep your face toward the light. If you're fishing and you stand there and your shadow is out over the river, the fish will flip their tails and go up the river and leave you in shoals. But if you can get your face toward the sun and your shadow is behind you, you'll catch fish. So don't get your shadow in the way. 
And of course, you need to study what kind of things fish do. Do you understand the unconverted and how they think and identify with them? And do you keep yourself well out of sight and be patient? You might fish all afternoon in that spot and catch nothing and go back the next day and catch a whole lot. You got to be patient when you're fishing, especially for the Lord. And don't condemn. Notice Jesus didn't get stuck into this woman and say, Look here, woman. You're a desperate woman. See the kind of life you've been living, that filly you're living with at the moment? This is ridiculous. You need my salt. No. No. You know, here's an unconverted fellow, and he's kind of friendly with you, and, and he says to you, would you like a smoke? You say, I don't smoke those things. Those will take you to hell, son. <laughs> don't smoke them. And he says, would you like to come for a drink? I don't touch that stuff. I do not. Get, that's ridiculous. What do you mean? A man like you, you know? And he thinks you're rejecting him. The key is to recognize that he's passing you a compliment. And generosity is implicit in the offer. And you've got to be careful and decline it, as you should, on a personal basis so that the person doesn't feel rejected. You say, no, won't come for a drink with you, but uh, I'll have a coffee with you sometime, or a Coke. Or I love to throw in, I'll have a ginger ale with lime. Oh, that really throws them. They really wonder at that. I tell them I mix my drinks. <laughs> you know, it's very important that when you refuse something that you offer an alternative. They say, would you like to come to come such and such a thing? And as a Christian, you'd feel you can't go. It would be dishonoring the Lord. Well, the way you refuse them, say, no, I won't go to that. But if such and such a thing comes to town, I'd love to go to that with you. And you don't have to be embarrassed about it. I mean, a non-Christian doesn't come to you and if you say to him, I want to play chess with you and say, well, I don't like chess. I'm a non-Christian. <laughs> he wouldn't react that way, would he? He'd say, no, no, I'm not into chess, but, but, but I, I go 10-pin bowling. And, you know, we jump in, don't we? We jump in so fast. We condemn so quickly. We should be very careful how we handle it. And remember, when you find alcohol being served at a function, you can politely request that soft drink. And if the host hasn't provided a substitute for non-drinkers, that's his social faux pas, not yours. You don't need to be embarrassed. And stick to the main issue. He didn't condemn her. He didn't condone her. But as she now rises in fever pitch interest in this living water that he's got, notice that she throws in a red herring, as we call it. Uh, she says, uh, she gets into denominations. This mountain, that mountain, Mount Gerizim is where we should worship. You Jews say that it's in Jerusalem. And she tried to get away. And Jesus wouldn't let her away with that. And so often you'll find when you witness to people gently and wisely and the Holy Spirit uses you and they're interested in becoming Christians, just at the very moment they're maybe near to trusting Christ, what do you do? You jump in and as you, or they jump in with a denominational question. They say, what church should I join? What church do you think I should join? Well, you'll be there for 10 years. If you get stuck in there sometimes, I think. Because it doesn't matter what local church you belong to, if you don't know Christ, you'll perish. You need Christ as your Savior. That's the important issue. Where they go on Sunday will come later. Don't let them divert you. Whenever you're witnessing for the Savior, confront them directly before you're finished. Jesus confronted her with himself. I am the Messiah. And she had to make up her mind. And you need to confront people as well. Well, when they come and they want to trust the Lord and they want to become a Christian, what do you do then? Well, I'm just going to give you a wee example of what I would do if I were in your shoes and I had to do this. And this will only take a minute and then you can go home. There should be a light there somewhere. Now, you may not be able to see this very well, but we'll try. 
If I, if, I were to, if I were to tell you the number of times that I have sat in those two chairs over there, friends, it's not exaggerating to say that dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times in this congregation, people have come after a Tuesday night meeting saying, I want to get saved. And sometimes coming down out of that pulpit there, within two minutes, people are saying, I want to get saved. Now what do you do? Do you start in Genesis, go through to Revelation? Well, what I do is this. I draw them. Oops, this isn't going to work. Got my other pen? Good. No, yes, just give it a wee minute. I think you can see that line. What I do is I draw... this on a piece of paper. And I say to them, did you ever hear of that song that Simon and Garfunkel wrote, Bridge Over Troubled Water? Well, I said, there is some troubled water. You say, that's not hard to draw. No. Don't need to be Picasso to draw that. He drew far worse. <laughs> and you say, reverently speaking, there's God. Reverently speaking. Yeah? And over here is you. We'll call you Mary. There's Mary. Now I say, Mary, between you and God, there is a lot of troubled water. And the Bible calls it sin. And if you're sitting in a restaurant talking to a person, you could draw this on the back of the napkin, if it's a paper one, or else you're in trouble. Or a wee piece of paper somewhere back of something. Sin comes between you and God, Mary. That's right. People will agree with you there. You say, well now, Mary, tell me, if this sin comes between you and God, is God saying, I don't care about you, Mary? Just go on down there to a lost eternity. I don't care about you. No. The Bible teaches that God loves sinners. So what did he do? Well, Mary, what he did was he built a bridge over the troubled water. And that bridge was the cross of Christ. You draw a wee cross like that. Now, Mary, would you please try to remember it's not a cross around your neck. It's not a cross on your wall. It's not a cross on a church building. What we are talking about is, and then I get out Isaiah 53. And I read to her that verse in Isaiah 53, which says that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace upon him, with his stripes we're healed. And I say, now Mary, there is God. And in the person of Jesus, he goes to the cross and he is punished for your sin on the cross. And you read that verse until that person understands the basic doctrine of substitution, Christ dying in their place. And how thrilling this has often been. I say, well now, Mary, Here's God and here's you and here's sin between you and here's the bridge over the troubled water which is the cross work of Christ. It's the only way between you and God to get through this problem of sin. The only way to get to know God. And I say now Mary, if you were to depend, and I really do try and talk to them about Calvary and what happened at Calvary, and I always try to write down the words, the finished work of Christ. 
sorry this isn't terribly clear, but those listening by audio will be able to hear it. The finished work of Christ. One of the most neglected doctrines in all of the world is the preaching of the finished work of Christ. That when Jesus died on the cross, he died to atone for sin. And that if Mary trusts in this fact that the lovely Savior died for her sin, what happens? If she rests on that finished work, her sins are forgiven. And then I say, well now Mary, if this is the bridge between you and God, are you prepared to rest on that finished work? And if she says, yes, I'm prepared to rest on that finished work, then we come to one of the most difficult things in leading souls to Christ. You must never force a person into any decision because if you argue them into it, somebody cleverer than you will argue them out. Salvation is a revelation from God, by God the Spirit. It is the Lord who reveals the truth to them. You explain it. But you can't save them. You cannot convert them. It is only the Lord who saves. He is the one who does the miracle, not you. And when you come to this point where the person says, yes, I'm prepared to rest in the finished work of Christ, then you must be very careful to draw back and make sure that they understand that it is their decision. Then, what I would invariably say would be this. I say, right, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray with you. And I pray with the person. I say, I'm going to keep quiet after I've prayed a wee while, and I'm going to leave a silent period. Don't want you to talk out loud. Don't want you to say anything out loud. But if you are prepared to rest in that finished work of Christ, if you're prepared to receive Christ as your Savior tonight, you do that during that silent period. You tell God you're prepared to rest in this finished work. Repent of your sin and receive Christ. And I say, now you understand when I pray, my prayer doesn't do anything for you. I don't save you. It's not Derek Bingham who saves you. It's the finished work of Christ that saves you. And if during that silent period you have received Christ, I'm not going to say to you, after we have both prayed or whatever, I'm not going to say to you, well now Mary, are you saved? Or I'm not going to say to you, Mary, well now you're saved, Mary, that's okay, you've received Christ. That's not my business. It is up to Mary, if she has received Christ, to confess Christ. It's up to her to confess him as her Lord, not me. So I would say to her, within the next 24 hours or 48 hours, if you have received Christ as your Savior, tell somebody. Share it with somebody. And I usually say, don't go into work in the morning with a huge big Bible under your arm saying, saved them, saved them, saved them, saved. If you have received Christ during this prayer. No, no. What we're saying is when you go into work tomorrow and maybe somebody says to you, I've got a whole lot of troubles and I don't know what to do. Why not say to them, the Lord Jesus could help you. You, you know, he's my saviour. And I say, it's out. You've confessed him. And of course, that's a very natural situation. And God would have us natural like that and not unnatural in our approach. You know, again and again, we've come to that point, left that silent period. Then I give them some literature and I say, if you've received Christ, tell someone. If you haven't received Christ tonight, do it soon. Again and again, from all over the country, the news comes back that they have confessed Christ and they have taken their stand. But it's very important that you explain it, come up to the point and draw back and leave that decision with them. Okay? Hope that helps you. And I hope that in restaurants and buses and planes all over the country, you'll get your wee pen out. And if somebody says to you, I want to become a Christian, why not use that method? It's not everybody's method, but I find it very useful in my circumstance. Okay?